All right. So good. Um, yes. First of all, I'm I'm really happy to be here. It's a very nice program, and uh, I'm happy to be given this opportunity to, to to give a talk here. So what I'm going to talk to today about is about how you can generate a strong atom dimer attraction in a Fermi Fermi mixture, and uh, this is work I've I've done. Uh, well, first of all, as a postdoc uh, working with Dmitry Petrov in Paris, and then I continued this in Cambridge, and, and right now I'm, I'm in Aarhus at the Institute of Advanced Studies. So the theoretical work I'm going to present to you is, is done with Dmitry and later with, uh, with Mira Parrish, who is here in the audience, and uh, her student, Budivat Nyamprudikon. Um, and uh, we also I'm also going to present some experimental work, and this is carried out by the group of Rudy Grimm um, in Innsbruck. And uh, I should also thank, of course, uh, some of my early collaborators in this project, as Jörg Valraman <coughs> and Tobias Ticke, who, um, <coughs> who were involved in the initial discussions of this. So, okay. So, uh, I just want to spend one slide on presenting what I think is really nice about an atomic gas, and probably all of you already know this, but uh, there are nuclear theorists here who may have a different way of thinking about things than I do. So, um, so first of all, uh, in, in these ultra-cold atomic systems, you have a two-body interaction which, is, which can be extremely simple in, in some limits. Because, so you have scattering of atoms, you have some kind of open channel scattering, and you have a closed channel. And in this closed channel here, there, there is, well, there are many bound states, but there can be one bound state that can be tuned through the kind of uh, scattering continuum here of the open channel, and that gives ri rise to a fastback resonance. So you have this standard picture here where you have a, uh, if you actually have a bound state in the system, you have a repulsive scattering length um, and a bound state here, and you can have an attractive, um, regime with a negative scattering length. So this scattering length can just be tuned with a magnetic field. And we can be in a regime where the scattering length is much, much larger than, than the range of the forces that actually gives rise to this interaction, so which is characterized by van der Waals uh, forces. So this is very nice uh, about atomic gases. Secondly, we can change the dimensionality of the system. So uh, what the experimentalists do is uh, they take counter-propagating laser beams and this generates an optical lattice and, uh, and the atoms can be trapped in the maxima of this uh, uh, optical lattice. Uh, or, uh, sorry, in the interference minima actually. Um, and you can create these kind of 1D tubes. You can make an actual lattice uh, that emulates a crystal structure. You can make uh, a series of plans, planes that's called pancakes, typically, and so on. Uh, you can also completely choose which atomic species you want to uh, work with well, within the periodic table. Um, so you can, you can control what the population is of, uh, of atoms in different hyperfine states. And this, in turn, also uh, means you can uh, control how the interactions are. So you can work with lithium and potassium and so on. So you can control uh, the different populations of these states. And, and from my perspective, at least, uh, the goal with these uh, quantum gases is to create some interesting phases which have uh, potential applications to the solid state. Um, so sort of going from uh, typically, well, you have some kind of two-body interaction, which is universal in a sense, and so we have a uh, universally emerging uh, uh, physics at the many-body level. For instance, here we have uh, BEC to BCS crossover, and uh, the fact that this system is superfluid is seen by taking the, the gas that they have and rotating it, and this rotation creates vortices, and you see how the vortices all across the, the crossover. So this is kind of interesting. So. One thing that people have been working on um, is, is to try and generate strong uh, P-wave interactions. And why would anyone do this? So first of all, if you have ultra-cold atomic gases, typically we have very low temperatures compared with van der Waals interaction strengths. 
Uh, and that means that typically you will have S-wave dominated interactions. So if you t have two different species of atoms, you can just consider this an S-wave interaction. But if you have identical uh, fermions, then they necessarily have to have <coughs> an anti-symmetric wave function and you need to consider P-wave interactions. And P-wave interactions are actually very interesting because they have some very unusual properties. So first of all, if you, if you take this system of, of identical fermions and you confine it to the 2D plane, then actually the phase that's called a PX plus IPY phase is predicted to be topological in this system. And this leads to a, a number of, of interesting properties. Uh, you have uh, gapless Majorana modes, you have non-abelian statistics, and uh, so people are very interested in this from the perspective of topologically protected quantum computing. What yes? Topological. Can you explain that? Uh, well, it means, for instance, well, topological is, for instance, it, you have this non-abelian statistics. So you have some, uh, you have Majorana modes. So you have some kind of system in, in the 2D plane. You, you rotate it and you generate vortices and you have Majorana modes that are kind of shared between these vortices. So, so they are kind of a, a long range object, they're not a local object. So it's a topological property of the system that you have these Majorana modes. So anyway, I mean, so this is, this is why people are interested in these uh, P-wave superfluids. Um, but on the other hand, when people try to do exactly the same as they did for the S-wave interaction, so they took a gas, they looked close to a Fesbeck resonance, but now they had identical fermions, and then they found that they had a very strong loss rate in this system here. And essentially this is because if you have identical fermions, there's a very large part of your wave function at the short distances of the order of the van der Waals interactions. So you have very strong um, recombination losses, which leads to losses from your trap. So, so this system is, is unstable, and, uh, and you cannot get to this uh, uh, P-wave superfluid state. And this is in complete contrast to the system of two-component fermions, where you have, uh, for instance, in three-body processes here, uh, you have a very large separation of scales between the short-range physics, that's the van der Waals physics, and, and the size of this bound state, for instance, which is, is a scattering length, which can be tuned to infinity, essentially. So you have a very large separation of scales combined with a Pauli blocking, which uh, makes this system here of two-component fermions incredibly stable, but on the other hand, this system is, is not very stable. Not that I know of, actually. I'm not sure, but usually for bosons, it would be difficult to ignore the S-wave scattering. But if you are at a resonance, I agree. But I don't know of any experiments in this. And also, you probably need, if you're asking what is inherently unstable means, you mean the first particle comes along. Yes. So the, the, the two-body problem is, is stable, but if a third particle comes along, they necessarily interact at a very short distance, uh, and, and also you mean to say that there's a resonance in the P wave. Equation. Yes, yes. So the the problem is, it's a, it can be stable if there's a weak interaction, but then you have uh, your critical temperature is exponentially suppressed. So you want to be close to the resonance, but once you're close to the resonance, on the other hand, you have very strong losses. <coughs> Um, well, I think the stability would not change, actually. But there are some, some ideas to try and stabilize these uh, P-wave interactions by using optical fastback resonances. So but I guess your argument is that if there's a resonance, then most of the wave functions are concentrated inside of the phase shift of area. That's exactly, yes. So that's different from S-wave ones, where they, yeah. the resonance can be extremely 
Yes. The molecular resonance can be extreme. But uh, mm -hmm. being a resonance, that means that it's not a bounded state. Really. So why would it uh, always be? No. Okay. But uh, so you have okay. to. You have to look at the, you, you can just look at the two-body Schrodinger equation and you can look at the scaling of, of your wave function and you will find that your wave function has a large weight at short distances because of the inclusion of the centrifugal barrier. But if you don't include this, then you will find that the wave function is more spread out. So this is the difference between S and P wave, that the wave function will necessarily have a, a large short-range component. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think so. This is only my motivation here. So, I think I would like to, <laughs> to press on here. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. So, um, so, the point here is that these uh, short range interactions with identical fermions are uh, kind of, like I say, inherently unstable. However, that should be uh, understood. But uh, what I want to present today is how you can instead consider long-range interactions between ultra-cold uh, identical fermions mediated by a third particle. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so, um, so this is an outline of the talk. So I'll discuss first how to, dis uh, how to generate these kind of long-range P-wave interactions in this heteronuclear system. And uh, so this is what I will call resonant atomic exchange. And I, I'll start by illustrating this within the born oppenheimer approximation, which gives a very nice kind of picture of it. Uh, then I'll present our theoretical predictions for the system and discuss how uh, strong atom dimer attraction in the system has been observed in the regime where you would naively expect strong atom dimer repulsion. But the, the attraction is essentially comes from this effect. Uh, then I'll specialize to the 2D problem afterwards and, um, and just present some, some theoretical predictions we have uh, for trimers with large mass ratio. Is in particular how you can get a hydrogen-like spectrum of, of trimers in the system. And finally, if I have time, I'll just discuss what some of the many uh, consequences for the many-body systems, uh, in particular here for the polarized gas. Okay, so what I'll, I'll consider here is a mixture of heavy and light fermionic atoms. So let's say blue and gray atoms, spin up, spin down. Uh, this can typically be, for instance, potassium atoms, which have uh, an atomic mass of 40, and lithium atoms, which have an atomic mass of 6. So uh, uh, the mass ratio is typically of the order of, of 6 to 7 here. And... Uh, and these, of course, have short-range interactions between these two um, uh, atoms here. And we assume that, th that the identical fermions do not interact at all. So there's a short-range interaction, but this short-range interaction is, on the other ha hand, characterized in the uh, low energy limit by a very large scattering length, which I'll call A here. So you can generate a long-range interaction between these heavy atoms by the process that I'll illustrate like this. So you have a tunneling of, of this light atom from this, from being bound with this atom to being bound with this atom here. So, okay. So you have some kind of tunneling effect here. Uh, and, and this interaction can actually be quite long range. And Yes, the bound state has uh, a size of so A. talking about interaction at distances larger than A or smaller than A? Similar to A. But there oh. be no tunneling there, there's simply the FMOV effect. Uh, no, it's not the FMOV effect, and this, this will become clear, but it's, it's related to, I mean... So that is really interaction, 
this S-wave interaction here, there's in principle S-wave interaction and P-wave interaction between an atom and a dimer and so on. But what I, I, I'll point out is, is there's a very interesting interaction in the P-wave channel. And this will come on the next slide, or oh, in two slides. So uh, just bear with me. Jasper, yes. That's true. But That's you're true. basically working at a mass ratio where the atom of fact is not yet there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's it. it ex exactly. That, that's that's what you no call it. No, the, there's a difference uh, between. Uh, I'll, I'll just preempt my slides a little bit. So, so, what you get is you get an effective potential between these two heavy atoms that's mediated by the light atom. and and if you have Efimov effect, this effective potential looks like this. And you have these kind of Efimov states, so this is in units of the scattering length, and you have Efimov states that sit here, and you have an accumulation of states here. Efimov means the following. If distance is smaller than A, you have 1 over R squared. Yes, and this here is exactly 1 over R squared. And this is exactly <laughs> a, a type, a you cover type. Yes, what I, uh, what I want to point out is that this here type of potential comes if you have a mass ratio which is larger than 13.6. But you can be in a regime if you have a smaller mass ratio where you have a repulsion at short distances. Then you have an attractive well and then you have a repulsion again. And here you can actually trap some states. And these states will sit typically at a distance of the order of, of the scattering link. And it's this potential here that can lead to a very strong interaction in the P-wave channel when you are very close, when you have a bound state in this potential which sits very close to the uh, scattering threshold. That's the point. Okay? Okay. So, um, so what I'll present first is just an intuitive picture of this, uh, which is the von Oppenheim approximation. So in this approximation, you assume that the light atom has a wave function, and, and this wave function just adiabatically adjusts, adjusts uh, itself to the position of the heavy atom. So we assume that there's no, um, no dynamics of the heavy atoms. They just sit at some distance, capital R, from each other. And then the wave function of the light atom is just uh, the free solution of, uh, of the two-body Schrodinger equation around each of these heavy atoms here. Okay? Um, and now the point is that, that this wave function here can have two different signs, so even or odd states. And because we want to have a totally anti-symmetric state uh, with respect to interchanging these two heavy atoms, we need to choose this minus sign here if we have even partial wave scattering of these two identical atoms, and we need to choose the plus sign for odd partial waves. So this, in turn, will generate two different effective potentials for the interaction between these two atoms. And this is actually uh, quite analogous to uh, the case in H2 plus um, molecules where you have a, an mediated e exchange between two uh, protons, essentially, or two, yeah, two protons, mediated by an electron, and you have two states. One is bound and one is unbound. And that's exactly the symmetric state is bound and the anti-symmetric state is unbound. So this leads to this potential here, this effective potential. And uh, here what I've done is I've included the um, centrifugal barrier. Um, so this is in the P wave channel. So I've chosen the, the symmetric wave function. And uh, at this potential, I've plotted for five, uh, four different mass ratios. So first of all, we see that if we have a mass ratio of 13.6, this potential goes like this. So it has this long range repulsion here and it has a short-range attraction which goes as 1 over r squared. So th this is exactly the FMF type of potential at short distances. But if you have a smaller mass ratio, then your 
um, your repulsion from the centrifugal barrier will overcome the attraction from the, uh, from the mediated attraction by the light atom. And uh, so at short distances, you will always have a barrier, potential barrier. So how did you yes. It's, uh, no, this is actually extremely simple. So this is just like a toy model, essentially. So what you do here is you take this wave function here, you use the beta pi as boundary condition, and that in turn gives you an equation that relates this kappa of r to the scattering length, and then you can, then you use that the energy of the light <coughs> atom is just kappa squared over two times its mass. So this kappa is a function of Yes, exactly. So this energy here, uh, or momentum that corresponds to an energy of the light atom depends only on the separation of the two heavy atoms. So this is a very simple uh, two-line calculation. And that yes. Yes. So this is still just a toy model. Uh, but it, it shows the essential features because it shows how you can develop this attractive well at a distance of the order of the scattering length. And here, if the mass ratio is larger than 8.2, you form a bound trimer state here. And this is what was shown uh, by uh, Katsavtsev and Malik uh, five, six, maybe seven years ago even. Uh, time flies. So, okay, so there's a bound state in this potential here. Now what I want to focus on here is, is uh, for instance, lithium potassium that has this mass ratio. And we see that there's not such a large attractive well here, but still what we'll find is that there's, there's a very strong effect of this attraction here. Essentially, the wave function is being pulled into this regime. So do you know anything more about this attractive well? Is it a one over uh, is in inverse polynomial, one over r to the at whole surface? Attractive tail, which? Yeah, this uh, inside. This, ah, this inside, here. Yeah. Uh, one over r side or one over r? <laughs> uh, that I don't actually know. I mean, I'm not sure you should think of it. I, I mean, this part here is a 1 over r squared repulsion. And this part here is, there's a 1 over r squared part here, I know. Then there's a Yukawa type tail, but exactly the form here, I'm not sure. So the answer is exponential. What's that? No, inside here, this hill. Oh. If you ask me to guess, I would think it's You can separate a simple polynomial in that region. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you simply solve the bottom of the higher equations and use your curve, that's a very Actually, simple thing. Uh, the form of the well, simply the numeric. Well described it by 1 over r squared plus uh, 1 over r coefficients. Mm -hmm. That's all. Should I trust uh, this result, this potential at very small distance? Because um, your time scale is very quick. Cannot be well, right? I think at very short distances you have yeah. the centrifugal barrier and it dominates everything. So I would actually trust it at very short distance. Um, I mean, we know that this is not, is not exact in this regime here. This is still just a picture. I want to emphasize this before I go into my actual calculations. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's good to kind of see the, the basic physics in terms of this potential here. Okay, so what we've seen here is that if you have a very large scattering length, then this potential here is actually a very long range potential, right? I mean, at, at the resonance, the scattering length diverges, so we can have very long range potential, attractive potential between two identical fermions. And that's the interesting thing. Yes. 13.6 is exact. This, this method it's gives 12.6, yeah. Mm -hmm. then, so how exactly do you define long range? Well, this is long range compared with Van der Waals physics, right? You, you tune close to a Fesbeck resonance, you have a very large scattering length, and this scattering length can be orders of magnitude larger than your okay. interatomic potential. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, another point I want to make is that actually this centrifugal barrier here automatically prevents uh, losses. So we don't have the usual loss channels that we have in the FMR physics 
where we have this fold to the center and we have many inelastic channels. So if we constrain ourselves to mass ratios in this regime here, we don't suffer from these uh, uh, large resonantly enhanced loss channels in, in, in the FMOP case. So this is kind of a new paradigm for few body physics where we can see in a three body system we can see something interesting which is not losses. Okay. At least I think so. Yes, yes. But as long as they're weakly bound, you can recombine into them and go out again, and it won't cause losses. Yes. OK, so just um, before we get into the actual theory, I just wanted to point out here, uh, this is, uh, these are the alkali atoms that uh, cold atoms have, have uh, considered so far, ultra-cold atomic systems here. Um, and we actually have quite a lot of mixtures available in different experiments here. Um, however, from, a, from the point of view of, of in being interested in fermions, we are quite limited. Actually, th the only two stable uh, atoms of these alkali atoms that have stable fermionic isotopes are lithium and potassium with a mass ratio of 6.64. So. Um, so we are a little bit limited in this. But on the other hand, uh, recent experiments have shown that you can now also cool dysprosium and erbium. So from, from some perspective, we may just consider the mass ratio a free parameter, of course. If you put them in a trap, yes. heavier atom to concentrate near the center, and mm -hmm. the one that you go towards the, 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 the outer. Yes. So the overlap Uh, Unless you are able to make a flat this, this track, does it well. No, this depends on, on your setup. I mean, typically the, the confining potential is relatively weak. So at the length scale of the scattering length, you know, the trap length scale is still much, much larger right. than that. So, so, so you don't think you see that the heavy atoms will be concentrated near the center? Oh, but this, uh, of course this happens. if. You, if, if you have an... Would it be significant overlap between the two clouds or not? Yes, that's what uh, I'll show you because, well, the experiment has been carried out by Rudy Grimm. And what they have, uh, I, ca I can tell you now, they have potassium here, mm -hmm. they have a very large cloud of lithium, and then essentially they blow away all the lithium at the edges just by RF transfer, and then they have kind of overlapping clouds here. That's basically what they do. Yeah, well, that's the time scale. Time scale of the experiment, yes. So this is that is not a long, long time scale state, right? It's not an equilibrium state. Well, I, okay, this again depends on details of the experiment, but in principle, you you know, it's two different atomic species, so you can use. They have different resonant frequencies. In in principle, you can you can choose traps that have the same confining frequency. Yes. Yes. No. No. Well, I thought about putting an extra circle here. I didn't want to explain it. Uh, ytterbium, uh, it's difficult to have feedback resonances with ytterbium. I know that there are proposals uh, to, to do exactly this, but uh, for now I think it's, it's difficult. These, these ones are much more immediate for experiment. But actually what I wanted to point out with this is that we have this whole periodic table to work with. That's that's true, but that's Rudy's proposal that he wants to do erbium potassium at least. That's uh, one of the next steps. Yes. Scanning a photon, getting a photon's momentum. Yeah, typically, 
for all these energy source or the surface or height. That is the advantage. And uh, the traps we are considering usually is not the high frequency, it's uh, the hundred meters frequency, more typically for magnetic traps. Uh, for optical traps, uh, it's possible, but we usually don't get all three dimensions into the high frequency. So that means uh, the temperature wise, if it's many body physics, they occupy many states. That uh, this uh, you know separation due to the of different gravity can be a gravitational wave is not a, not significant. This has not been studied by a number of people. I for the basic reason why lithium was really that Can I just yes. yeah. here at least to raise the yes. lithium? Let him finish the talk, we have a whole discussion session. Yes, no, yes. No, I think this is better for the discussion session. Like okay. So just one uh, slight, uh, you could call it problem with these uh, um, heteronuclear mi mixtures is that they are typically very narrow in the magnetic field width. And this in turn translates into having an effective range which is also much lighter than the van der Waals range of the atomic interactions. So it's related to the uh, difference in the, in the magnetic moments of these open and closed channels. So um, for instance, in the potassium lithium mixture, you have a, this parameter, which I'll call R star, which is minus one half times the uh, uh, effective range of the system, is 2000 Bohr radii, whereas the van der Waals range is of the order of 50. So, uh, so there's a very large separation of scales here. And actually, it's extremely difficult to get into the regime where A is in turn much larger than, where the scattering length is much larger than this uh, R star parameter. So in the theory that I'll present now, I'll actually consider a two uh, parameter theory, which includes both the effective range, uh, both the scattering length and the effective range, because these are typically much, much larger than all the other parameters which characterize the two-body interaction. Yes, Pro presumably. Actually, this I, I'm not sure is completely understood, but presumably it is. Um, OK. So in order to model this here, we use a two-channel model. And this uh, two-channel model contains something, uh, these annihilation and creation operators, like this, uh, of the open channel atoms. We have the closed channel components. And we have an exchange term of open channel and closed channel here. And this model contains a few parameters. It contains a coupling constant here, which couples open and closed channels. And it contains a kind of bare detuning of the closed channel. Uh, and actually, it also contains a parameter which is hidden, which is a, a renormali renormalization length uh, scale or, uh, or momentum cutoff, which we will just take, essentially we will take our, our interaction to be constant up to some cutoff and then <laughs> just zero. And uh, performing the renormalization here, we relate the scattering length and the effective range to the bare parameters of the model. And I'll work only in the regime here where you actually have a, a bound state in the model which has a binding energy, which is given like this. Is there also a deep pulse? What's that, sorry? Is there a deep pulse? Uh, no, not, not in this bare model. I mean, you have, you have, this, uh, you have this bare detuning here, but the bare detuning is, uh, I guess, OK, I mean, we don't explicitly uh, include the deep bound state as such. OK, anyway, so now we finally get back to the three-body problem. Uh, and now I want to do things exactly within this model where we have a large scattering length and a large effective interaction. And this three-body uh, problem can be conveniently expressed as follows <coughs> using this skorniakov termatirosian integral equation. So essentially, you have an atom and a dimer scattering an infinite amount of times, is essentially. And this can be described by a, an integral equation that looks like this. And once you have this F tilde parameter, which is essentially this vertex here, 
Then you can relate that back, if you take an on-shell condition, you can relate it back to the scattering amplitude, scattering uh, phase shift of the atom and dimer and, and the cross-section. So uh, I don't want to go into details about how we calculate this, but, but this is the typical t uh, sort of integral equation that you have, have to solve. So it corresponds exactly to the pictures that I was showing before. OK, so we carry out the solution of this integral equation. And uh, these are the results for the potassium-lithium mixture. So this is for the, for the phase shifts. So what I'm showing here is the S-wave phase shifts in black, <coughs> P-wave phase shifts in blue, and D-wave phase shifts in purple. And the important thing that I want to point out here is that at least if we can take this parameter R star to be zero, we find that the phase shift increases very, very quickly as a fun function of collision energy. It increases very, very quickly to pi over 2, and then it remains roughly constant. And uh, so this is a, what is known as a P-wave resonance. So we have a resonant type of scattering, which is essentially as strong as a uh, uh, the, the limit of scattering can be. Okay. We are also have S-wave scattering, but it has negative phase shift and is not uh, nearly as, as strong. What's that? Should go to pi to be as strong as unitary, not pi over 2. Uh, pi over 2 is not the resonance. The resonance would be if it goes to pi. Okay. That, um, let's see. You want your, it's true that up to pi is, is a condition for a, a new, uh, for having a bound state. On the other hand, if you think in terms of the elastic cross section. Isn't the phase shift for resonance 90 degrees? No, that's where it's the position of the resonance, but you have to go on the other side. You have to go okay. Let me, let me state it slightly differently. If I want to have the strongest possible elastic cross-section in the system, I want my phase shift to be pi over 2 such that sine squared here is 1. Do we agree with this statement? For, for that reason, you only have that's a, how would you phase shift for a narrow range of uh, energy? This is, this is a three-body problem. This is not a two-body problem, I want to remind you. I mean, he, he wants a large cross-section, and certainly the cross-section yes. is large. Yes, because we, we want to see a very large energy shift in, in the interactions caused by this atom-dimer interaction. And this is the largest possible when we have a phase shift of pi over 2. OK. Um, anyway, so let me s uh, plot what this means in terms of the cross-section here. So these are the cross-sections. Again, we have, now I've, I've plotted this slightly differently. So I have, if, if this R star parameter can be taken to zero, and essentially you can view this as being right on the resonance when A is much larger than R star, and then you move away from the resonance until, for instance, the scattering length is of the order of R star. So what we see here is that, of course, at zero energy, uh, the P-wave scattering is zero, so we have always, the cross-section is always dominated by S-wave scattering. But very, very quickly, again because of this effect here, the P-wave scattering completely dominates the problem. And uh, S-wave scattering can be kind of ignored in this regime. And even when we're quite far away from the resonance, when, when A is equal to this R star parameter, we see that S and P-wave scattering uh, cross-sections are essentially the same for a large uh, range of energies. So if I compare this with, with the result for equal masses, we see that this is completely different. For equal masses, S-wave scattering always dominates, and P-wave scattering, D-wave scattering, and so on can be quite neglected. So this P-wave resonance behavior is a unique consequence of having this mass imbalance in the system. Uh, OK, let me just go back. So you see how, how the effective range, increasing the effective range, decreases the phase shifts. And this can also be seen in, in terms of the Born-Oppenheimer 
potential, where we just see that having a finite effective range here, again going through the same values here, essentially reduces the effect of this atom dimer interaction towards the centrifugal barrier. And okay. It's just, this is again just a Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Now you have to modify your beta piles boundary condition because you have an effective range. So that introduces a, a condition that has an extra parameter. But, um, but this can be done. OK, so let me go to the experiment. So this carried out in the group of Rudy Grimm in Innsbruck. So what they have is a thermal mixture of potassium atoms, potassium lithium dimers, and uh, they investigate this mixture using RF spectroscopy. So they have a mixture like this, where we have lithium atoms, potassium atoms, and potassium atoms in a different hyperfine state. So now it's not the same as this. Are they in the third one? Space uh, this, yes, this here is a Feshbach uh, associated dimer. A particular yes, a particular so magnetic field. Right? Yes, yes. It's, it's the widest possible that they can choose. Uh, it has, there's a slight problem with using that one because it's an excited hyperfine level of the potassium atoms. Mm -hmm. So you introduce an inelastic channel. Mm -hmm. But on the time scale of this experiment, this is OK. We can still see the essential physics. But for many body physics, this is a problem. OK. So, okay, so they do RF spectroscopy. And what does that mean? It essentially means that they flip the spin of this atom either into the strongly interacting state that interacts strongly with these guys or out of it. Okay, so this is a RF procedure. And this is the result from the experiment. So um, this is a signal as a function of detuning from the bare, uh, bare transition between these two hyperfine states. And what you see here is, is a quite broad peak. This is just a one specific peak that uh, we've chosen to illustrate the physics. Um, the signal here is just a fraction of atoms that's transferred from one state to the other as a function of the RF detuning. And, um, and, and these two different curves, uh, uh, dots here, are just the two different ways of observing this, the spectrum either going into or out of the strongly interacting state. But what's important here is that there's a shift of the peak here from zero. And unfortunately, there are very broad wings here. And the very broad wings are essentially from the time scale of the experiment. But we see consistently a shift of the, of the, of the peak. When you see the shift of the peak, can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that's a, that's a problem, is that the, the wings are much larger. I mean, so, so you have to fit a, you know, Lorentzian to this kind of data. And, and so you, you find a shift that this is shifted towards uh, negative values. But the shift is smaller than the, than the width. Sorry, what uh, is the blue color? The, uh, the blue color here is going from the interacting state to the non-interacting state. And the reason why there's a larger shift to negative frequencies is that in that case you have attraction. So let's say you have a mixture of heavy atoms and uh, light atoms and, and some loose heavy atoms. And if you start from the strongly interacting system, you can have, you have kind of higher, higher order correlations where these are both attracted here. That's at least our understanding of, of, of the reason why you have a higher... Um, Yes. This is uh, this is still relatively low. I don't remember the exact number, but in terms of Na cubed, it's something like 0.1 or something like that. So it's. So they are comparable at that point. Yeah, but. It's it slightly I mean, the blue so data points, they yes. look to me like this is a very asymmetric shape. Yes, yes. We spend a lot of time trying to understand this asymmetric shape. And it's essentially because of higher order effects 
where you, you start from attraction and then you essentially you get more attraction because these atoms and dimers have already a attracted each other, whereas if you start from the non-interacting state, there are no such correlations in the system. Can you just fit a Lorentzian to this? Is this really the right thing to do? I'm not sure exactly what fit. This is the experimentalist apply a fit, but I mean we consistently see a uh, a shift of the of the peak position, and this is very stable. Um, okay, so the way we inter interpret this data here is uh, in terms of this theory here, but I just want to mention first what the mean field prediction is for this. So. It essentially, if you have a potassium atom in the bath of, of dimers, then you would, in mean field, you would just predict that the energy shift goes as the density of the dimers times the atom dimer scattering length times the reduced mass of the atom dimer pair. And this here, because the atom dimer scattering length is uh, positive, is always larger than zero. Now, uh, the theory that we use is actually this impact theory of pressure-induced effects on spectral lines. It's essentially, you can consider this as being a finite energy version of this, um, where you have a frequency shift which is proportional to the mean density of dimers and the real part of the uh, forward scattering amplitude. Um, and this is, again, this reduced mass. We're just using a different notation. So the forward scattering amplitude just has this form. It has a real part and an imaginary part. Jasper, yes. Your mean field equations, so the atom dimer scattering lengths that you're writing there, that's yes. in the S wave channel? That's the S wave, yes. And that should only be applicable if your distance scale is big, meaning if your uh, atoms are far away. Yes. So this is exactly, this is only applicable if the temperature scales are much temperature and distance scales are much smaller than the, um, no, are much larger than, than the size of the dimer, yes. So I thought throughout the first part of your talk you tried to convince us very hard that mean field wouldn't work. This doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> That's the point. This <laughs> always predicts a positive energy shift. Now we have an actual theory here, which uh, is in terms of the forward scattering amplitude, which is an energy dependent, collision energy dependent quantity, which you then have to average over the thermal distribution in the cloud. And once you get this, you see that you can have a, an attraction instead of the repulsion that's predicted by mean field theory. But then this uh, uh, ion drive is just a coupling of continuum to a bond state in a continuum. Uh, in the continuum, yes, because the RF coupled to that, which should be a bundle. Uh, it should be a what? Should it, the line shift should be a bundle patch band, yes, right? Uh, this is, uh, we don't actually have a bound state in this system. We, um, I mean, we have a mass ratio, which is a 6.6, .6, which is different from the mass ratio where you get a trimer state, which is 8.2. Okay. Two into this. So no, but. Yes, sure, sure. We also have, this is a part from the, from the bound state. But this, we always work in a regime where the RF spectroscopy has an atomic peak and a bound state peak. And this is well separated. So we only look at the atomic peak, which is this one here. Okay. Uh, wait a second. <coughs> Okay, so uh, this theory here also through the optical theorem predicts uh, what the, essentially the broadening, the width of the peak should be related to the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. So I'll just show our results here. Um, so this is the result for the peak shift and we see how this, uh, well, we have the experiment points and the theory line here. Uh, and we see how we get quite a nice fit here, okay? Um, and this is, does not really depend on the temperature. I mean, we always look at the thermal mixture, but we always get a fit that, that's quite good. And for the broadening of the peak, we also see that our theory actually predicts the broadening quite well. And how, how do you determine the peak shift? So this is from fitting a Laurentian to this data, or? 
I, we can discuss later. I have to check this. Yes. Mm -hmm. But so what I want to point out here is that we go from a regime where we have essentially this is like the mean field regime where, where your theory is dominated by S-wave scattering and the S-wave scattering length to a regime where you have this large attraction instead of the repulsion that mean field theory would predict. So we have, and this is dominated by P-wave scattering. And I want to emphasize here that this is a theory without any adjustable parameters. This is really just atom dimer scattering theory. Where is the resonance by Resonance, oh, the two-body feedback resonance is here. And this is the detuning in terms of uh, milligauss. Sorry. OK. Um, let's see. So you can also plot this in terms of something that you could sort of understand as an effective temperature dependent, uh, experiment dependent scattering length. Essentially, so this is, these are the results that you would predict for S wave scattering only, actually including the energy dependence. And we see that if you include only S wave scattering, uh, you don't get anything that looks like the experimental data here for the peak shift. Uh, whereas the theory that includes all the higher partial waves uh, matches quite well. And actually here we've used 16 partial waves because the further you get here, the more and more partial waves you need. But this kind of initial crossover from repulsion to attraction can be understood only in terms of S and P waves. OK, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time a little bit. But if you give me another few minutes, I can just tell you quickly about our theoretical results in 2D instead. Um, OK, so we've seen this enhanced scattering in the higher partial waves, which is an indication that, that there should be trimers at a slightly ma larger mass ratio, as predicted. So uh, it was predicted that this larger mass ratio in 3D is 8.2. So two heavy atoms, one light atom here. Uh, on the other hand, in 2D, it's predicted that this mass ratio is 3.3. .3. So it's natural to ask, can we just use a confinement um, to uh, kind of induce these trimers? And this is actually the first question we asked in this uh, context. Uh, so that's from this paper here. And so what we show here, this is as a function of uh, confinement length in units of scattering length, and this are star parameters in units of confinement length. We found the critical confinement, which is these two curves here, and they differ only in, in that this curve here only considers confinement of the heavy atoms, whereas this curve here considers confinement with the same confining frequency for both. Uh, atoms. But the important point is that if you are in a regime like uh, around here, which is experimentally kind of realistic regime in terms of the known value of R star, then the, uh, the confinement frequency which is needed in order to induce these trimers is of the order of 25 kilohertz. So this is within the experimental range. So this is kind of a, a natural next step to try and, and do in this system. OK, let me just uh, quickly walk you through the 2D case with a very large mass ratio. So uh, this was studied first by Prikopenko and Petri. And they noticed the following. Well, you have no trimers for equal masses. You have a first trimer that appears at 3.3, second trimer that appears at 10.4, and so on. But so this is, this is a plot of the energy as a function of the mass ratio. So you see the first trimer comes here second trimer comes here, third trimer comes here, and so on. And what's interesting is that they have these circles here. And that's actually the, so these lines here, P waves, so it's S, P, D, F wave states that are here. And you see how these are actually degenerate with the P wave states. So we thought this was kind of interesting, uh, that you have these degenerate trimers. So we wanted to understand what is the, what is the source of this. Uh, and also, why do you just get an ever-increasing number of trimers uh, instead of FMF effect? And for instance, you can look at this paper by uh, Shina, who's here in the audience, and, and Yusuke Nishida from 2011, 
We were discussing how there's no FM of effect in 2D because the interaction vanishes at short ranges. Now, of course, we know from the talk by Mira here on, on Friday that actually this is only if you take a 2D interaction, but in the realistic systems you have to consider a 3D interaction. But okay, I'll ignore this point for now and just say, okay, what happens if you have a very large mass ratio? And it's actually very simple. So what we do is, uh, well, we can solve it as exactly uh, as I described before. But I just want to present this uh, von Oppenheimer picture, which is very nice for understanding the physics. So we can calculate an e effective potential at short ranges. And it turns out that in 2D, when you have a very large mass ratio, this effective potential just takes the following form. It's just minus A2D over the separation of the heavy atoms times some prefactor. Okay, so this is like a hydrogen atom. You know, it just has a 1 over R uh, form. And uh, so we can just look in some uh, old, uh, whatever, books that have, uh, have solved the hydrogen atom in 2D. We know exactly what are the energy levels. And the energy levels look like this in this potential here. So in particular, we find this typical hydrogen atom behavior where we have a 1 over n squared behavior. In 2D, that's replaced by 1 plus n half. Uh, in over, uh, one n plus one half. Sorry. Okay. So this is these are the energy levels that we get, and what's important to note is that this effective potential here is already uh, is in all partial waves. There's a centrifugal barrier, and the centrifugal barrier essentially just means that your solution starts with an n from your L component. So this equation completely explains why these energies are degenerate among different partial waves. Can you reach that limit in any realistic system? I mean, this, you want R small compared to the two-dimensional scattering length, but probably also one in large compared to the Van der Waals length. So yes. So you can delete what comes out of this calculation. Is this the realistic? The problem, uh, actually, A2D can be co become very large because we know that it goes as e to the minus LZ over A, where A is the 3D scattering length and LZ is the confinement frequency, uh, confinement length. So that means that A2D can become very large. The problem is to reach temperatures that are low enough to actually measure any of this. Because in this regime, the temperature scale of the 2D dimer is, is so incredibly low, it's exponentially suppressed. So this is a problem with this. But the separation of scales is as such fine. It's really just getting to the correct temperature regime. <coughs> so we have all these uh, bound states that sit in this potential and are like hydrogen atoms. So this is our plot of the, of the energies in the P wave channel as a function of the square root of the mass ratio. And uh, well, what we see is that the exact energies, which are these solid lines, match very well onto this, uh, this von Oppenheimer type um, formula. Okay, And what we see also is that actually these bound states appear to come uh, with even spacing in terms of the <coughs> square root of the mass ratio. So this we can also understand. Oh, OK, let me say that first. This we can also understand because we can simply solve the Schrodinger equation in, in this one of our potential. And we just find that this is a Bessel function. And the Bessel function uh, has a node every time the argument here increases by pi. So that means that it should, the number of bound states simply should scale a square root of the mass ratio. OK. Um, this, is, this is from Born Oppenheimer, but it becomes exact in the limit of very large mass ratio. So yeah. Yeah. So it becomes exact over here. The statement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and actually, what we can also see from the von Oppenheimer approximation is that we know that that the identical fermions. So you have two heavy atoms and one light atom, and now the light atom for the fermions has to choose the uh, even wave function here. But for the bosons, this light atom uh, also chooses the heavy wave, 
also chooses the even wave function. Okay, so that means that actually the spectrum of bosons should also be degenerate with the spectrum of fermions, but now in even partial waves instead of odd partial waves. So that's that's the last point I want to make in this talk. Actually, is that this also works very nice. So now we have the fermionic lines again, and the bosons are these black dots. And we find that these are very nicely degenerate with the fermionic lines. So this is in the S-wave channel. OK, I think I'll, uh, I'll skip this here and just go to the conclusions. OK, so what, what I've described is how you can get these strong, strong stable, long-range P-wave interactions in a quantum gas, uh, and how it's been observed in experiment. And I've described this uh, emergence of a hydrogenic spectrum at large mass ratio in 2D. So of course, the outlook would definitely be to try and get these trimers. Um, and I didn't mention this. OK, so I want to thank my theory collaborators uh, here, Dmitry Petrov, uh, Mira Parish, and Mira Student Wave here. And uh, I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks. Have five more minutes for questions, and the rest uh, of the discussion we should. Uh